businessman and cultural supporter Osman Kavala was taken into custody in Istanbul. Osman Kavala gilt als einer der wichtigsten Unterstützer der türkischen Zivilgesellschaft. Aber für Präsident Recep Tayyip Erdogan ist Kavala ein Staatsfeind. Gezi davasının tek tutuklu sanığı Osman Kavala'nın tutukluluk halinin devamına karar verildi. There is absolutely no evidence for the charges against Osman Kavala. Mahkeme davanın tek tutuklu sanığı iş insanı Osman Kavala'ya hükümeti ortadan kaldırmaya teşebbüsten ağırlaştırılmış müebbet hapis cezası verdi. Lebenslange Haft, so lautet das Urteil des Gerichts in Istanbul gegen den türkischen Kulturmäzen Osman Kavala. The focus of my life is the unbelievable injustice and discrimination my husband has faced. I imagine you'd like to talk to me about that. I think I'm experiencing a different sense of time here. It flows faster. The boundaries between days and months become blurred. It's as if they are mixed with each other. I don't have much to complain about the conditions and treatment here. I think this is one of the better managed prisons in Turkey. I think I'm used to living alone in my room. I prefer this solitude to sharing the prison space with others. I mostly miss living together with my wife in our house. I visit my husband in jail once a week, on Tuesdays. I was there this Tuesday too. It's a one-hour visit. Mostly they're closed visits. That means there's a pane of glass between us and we talk using a phone. My mother is 97 years old. It makes me very sad to think that I may never see her again. Sometimes it seems strange to me that I've never seen his cell. Once he sent me a picture he'd drawn with his table and his bed. But of course that doesn't give me a complete picture of it. I remember it very well. He wasn't in Istanbul at the time. He'd gone to Gaziantep to hold talks with the city government about organizing a cultural program for refugees. The security took me into custody upon my return as we were disembarking the plane. The prosecutor demanded my arrest without even seeing me. Initially, I was thinking I would be released in a few days, but this treatment, in particular the behavior of the prosecutor, made me understand that this was not just a mistaken measure due to an initial suspicion, which would soon be understood as unfounded.
sivil toplumun üzerindeki baskıyı sürdürmek için AKP ve MHP The coalition regime made up of the AKP and the MHP arrested Osman Kavala to put pressure on civil society. He stood for everything they didn't want. He was an entrepreneur who supported civil society and artists, defended minority rights and was also extremely polite about it. This place was built as a tobacco warehouse. My grandfather was born in Kavala. He was a tobacco merchant. That's why the warehouse was built here. Of course, I don't remember those times, uh, but I know a bit the history of this neighborhood. In 2002, together with some uh, colleagues, uh, we established a cultural organization called Anadolu Kultur. My name is Asena Gunal. After Osman Kavala's arrest, I became director of Anadolu Kultur. We thought that uh, contemporary art definitely contributes to critical thinking, self-reflection, uh, to understand uh, the issues influencing uh, the, the culture, the political culture. Osman Kavala isn't your average boss. He's very friendly and thoughtful. He always tries to be on an equal footing with the people he works with. I find it amazing how Osman Kavala always tries to make good use of the wealth that's come from his family's business. You could even say he's almost embarrassed by the resources he has. He doesn't fit the stereotype of a rich person. Earning money is fine, but I think that to live in a society where people of different faith and ethnicity feel as equal citizens and poor and rich enjoy similar public services is a great privilege. And believing that your work contributes to the advent of such a society also gives a feeling of enrichment, despite some risks it entails. Our first destination was Diyarbakır, uh, center of the Kurdish region with a strong cultural heritage. Our projects have drawn attention to things like Turkey's Armenian cultural heritage or violations against the rights of different ethnic groups. We've tried to create a foundation on which everyone in Turkey can feel like an equal citizen. So our work hasn't tried to divide society, just the opposite, we've tried to unite it. If you look closely, it's clear our work hasn't changed much. What has changed is the Erdogan regime and its transformation into a one-man state, and the pressure that's now being put on all dissenting voices. We really didn't think anything would happen to us as a result of this work. Gül, gül. 
When I first learned about the plan of the government to build a shopping mall that would totally destroy the park, I joined my colleagues in a campaign to convince the government and the public that this was a terrible idea. My office is almost adjacent to the park. This made it possible for me to observe the young people and talk with them. I was impressed by their determination to protect the park, their strong sense of justice and the spirit of solidarity among them. The majority of them had no ties with an organization. And probably it was their first time participating in such an action. Daha büyük bir çoğunluğunun hakkı olduğunu ve bu eylemin terörizm olmadığını, sadece hakkın aramadığını, arandığını düşünüyorum ve Tayyip Erdoğan'ın bunu başbakanımızın bunu görmesini istiyorum. Herkes burada kendini mağdur hissetti ama o gezi parkını biz asla yıkılmasına izin vermeyeceğiz ve e, her şey çok güzel olacak. This is Osman's office. It's just a few steps from here to Gezi Park. You can even see it from the window. Osman spent most of his childhood and youth in the basement of this building, so Gezi means a lot to him. When the protests started, he could see what was happening there. And as well as that, of course, saving the park was important to him. Birkaç tane çapulcunun o meydana gelip insanımızı tahrik etmesine biz pabuç bırakmayız. It wasn't just about Gezi. In the lead up to the protests, a lot of pressure was being exerted on people, and they'd simply had enough. It essentially became a struggle for human dignity. Devrim meydanı. Tayyip Erdoğan ve Tayyip Atatürk bu ülkeyi terk edene kadar buradayız. Buradan bir yere gitmeyeceğiz. When I first heard that my husband was accused of organizing and financing the events at Gezi, I thought it was a completely fanciful accusation. A fantasy. That's the only way I could describe it. During the protests, I brought a loudspeaker and a plastic table to the park. These, in addition to some cookies, constitute the evidence. The only evidence provided in the indictment in support of the allegation that I had funded the protests. Gezi was a people's movement. Three and a half million people took part in it across almost every Turkish province that can't be organized and financed by a single person. Bunlar masum bir ayaklanma hadisesi değildir. Bunlar ciddi manada perde arkasında Soros türü bazı ülkeleri ayaklandırmak suretiyle Oraları karıştıran tipler vardır. 
Onun da Türkiye ayağı malum içeride değil. Mr. Erdogan started making grave accusations against me even before the indictment was prepared. I think neither the government nor the prosecutors who prepared the indictment actually believe in the absurd allegation that I planned and organized the protests in collaboration with George Soros. In fact, there's no evidence in the utterly contrived and absurd indictment for which Osman Kavala is on trial. There's probably no one left in the world who doesn't know this, but these injustices continue. Visiting day is the most important day of the week for me. The one hour we spend together is the most important hour of the week for me. As much as we can, we try to talk about normal things, things we like, about the books we've read. All books sent to the prison get this stamp to show they've been checked. Here's the stamp. This is one of the books that Osmun has read and sent back. I read mostly fiction. To enter into the lives of others, travel in other worlds, helps to overcome the physical constraints. Besides contemporary fiction, I reread classics and discover many new things which I had not noticed or understood previously. When we can, we try to read the same books at the same time. That really helps to keep us afloat. I'm happy that we share this passion, that we like to read, and that we can share that. We share our impressions and thoughts about the books we have been reading in our correspondence. When I come across something which I find exciting, I think of sharing it with Aisha and speculate how she would react to it. It could be said that reading a novel also means to enter a conversation with the author. When I read, I try to involve Aisha in this conversation as well. Books are a lifesaver for him. Only ten books are allowed in the cell at one time. So if I want to get him new books, some others have to be taken away. There's a lot of traffic. Books are constantly coming and going. When a big disaster happens, it goes without saying that people want to be with the person they're closest to. That was the first thing I felt, that we weren't together.
I usually sleep very deeply, but I woke up so you can imagine how intense the earthquake was. I instinctively just thought about the children's groups that we work with. I'm Yutar Erel Tumar, founder and director of Colourful Hopes. At that moment, I thought about the children and wondered if they were safe, because Colourful Hopes is still the only place these children can go, knock on the door, ask for advice and feel comfortable. Unfortunately, it's become clear that the state doesn't have the capacity to deal with such a large earthquake. I imagined how horrible this feeling of desperation must be. I was really upset that I couldn't take part in the relief efforts. Reportedly, there were people crying for help from under the rubble while their friends and relatives were able to hear their voices, but unable to save their lives. If I had been free on the day of the earthquake, I'd have tried to contact my friends in the region and organized ways to help. Right after the first earthquake, we decided the situation in Adiyaman is bad, so let's go there. The first team we sent was not allowed to enter the earthquake area. There was no trace of the state for three days, and all access points were blocked by the military. I think this situation reflects a major failure in the functioning of the state institutions to protect the lives and well-being of the citizens. The fact that no minister or public officer resigned in the aftermath of the disaster, unlike what happened in other countries, reveals the lack of feeling of responsibility towards the public. Açık konuşuyorum. Namussuz kişiler kampanya yaparak Hatay'da biz asker göremedik, biz jandarma göremedik, polis göremedik gibi yalan yanlış iftiralar atıyorlar. Ben sana yaptım sen beklemedin. Merhaba. We came here maybe a week after the earthquake, and since then we've been working not only on the playgrounds that we've set up here, but also sharing our experiences on how to work in a child-centered way. I had the opportunity to visit Diyarbakir and the other southeastern cities at a young age. This experience made me realize that this region of my country is very different. My conversations with Kurdish friends helped me to better understand how they feel in the face of the repressive and discriminatory policies the Kurdish citizens are facing. During the war, we organized activities with children. We literally pulled the children away from the barricades and did things with them so they could leave the world behind for a while and we could take care of their well-being. 
One day Osman Kavala visited us, and a short time later, about 20 days after he left Diyarbakir, he announced a children's fund. The money enabled us to do more specialised work for children. After the war, the children rejected their culture and mother tongue because they had developed a kind of defence mechanism. They thought everything they were exposed to was because they were Kurds. And by rejecting their Kurdish identity, they actually felt safe by becoming Turks. This was a terrible outcome. Something had to be done about this. That's why we started developing a culture of peace for the children, to ensure that they feel at ease with their own identity and culture. Üzerine çalışmalar başlattık. Buhara Türkçe kulik ve beli zesta. Habina gönderme. I thought that promoting collaboration between artists, writers and intellectuals from Istanbul and Diyarbakir would contribute to the development of mutual understanding, hence trust, which is necessary to feel ourselves as a member of the same community. One of the first Anadolu Kultur activities I participated in was a program for children in Diyarbakir. To see how much they loved it, how much they needed this attention. I'll never forget that. In the indictment prepared against me, it is written that I have worked with the minority groups in order to incite them against the government behind the veil of cultural programs. We've been working in southeastern Turkey for 20 years, and it's the first time such a bogus accusation was made by an official authority. This shows the rise of an authoritarian mentality with an anti-minority edge in the political domain. A colleague called me and asked if I could take on the case, because Osman Kavala is someone I know and whose work I respect, I naturally said yes. I'd never have guessed that this case would drag on for so long, that it would change so much. So you wait throughout the entire trial for an answer. What crime? What evidence? You listen to what the lawyers say, and there's nothing. When the hearings came to an end, I left, because I couldn't listen to the same words, the same sentences any longer. I couldn't take it anymore. Kanıksanması <gülüyor> This is a specific case that shows how Turkey is unfortunately infringing international agreements. 
And in all the hearings, we've repeatedly said, the European Court of Human Rights has made a decision. You have to abide by this decision. The Turkish constitution requires it. And if a legal conflict arises between an international agreement and a national law, the former takes precedence. Überraschend wurde Osman Kavala heute von dem Vorwurf freigesprochen, die Gezi-Proteste finanziert zu haben. On Tuesday, Kavala was unexpectedly cleared and released. It was as if a great weight was lifted off my shoulders and I felt relieved. I packed my belongings and bid farewell to prisoners in nearby cells. I was made to get in the van waiting in front of the building. I was expecting to be at home as soon as possible. I waited for hours with our relatives and friends to meet my husband at a facility near the prison. And after hours of waiting, I learned that he had been re-arrested on another charge from which he'd previously been acquitted and would remain in jail. When the lawyers informed me the president had harshly criticized my acquittal, I realized a judicial decision not in conformity with his preferences could not hold. This was of course a form of torture, but it prepared me for the potential injustices I would later face. I think this was the day the word torture first came to mind. Osman Kavala has been given a life sentence without parole. Osman Kavala is so lebenslange Haft verurteilt worden. The businessman has already spent over four years in prison without a conviction. Now Kavala has been sentenced to life behind bars. When I heard the verdict, what I felt was deep sorrow for the state of the judiciary and the judges in my country. I think the different phases of this political trial, the use of different charges to extend my detention, and finally this verdict made very clear the manipulation involved in the judicial processes in Turkey and the abuse of the Turkish penal system. I am trying to keep my peace of mind, and I am waiting for a political change in my country. Yatıyorlar, kalkıyorlar. Kavala, 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 kavala. Ya kavala dediğin Soros'un Türkiye şubesi. During the day, I had the opportunity to use my small courtyard to walk. In summer, I feed the sparrows that have their nests up above the walls. I catch glimpses of seagulls flying over in the direction of the sea. I also enjoy watching the clouds, their shapes and movement. These make me feel closer to nature. The feeling that I've been trying to avoid all this time is hope. Hoping can be very consuming. When I think of Osman Kavala, he's one of the most important people to personally support the contemporary art movement. I'm Ateş Alpash, a conceptual artist. I've worked with photography and video for 10 years. Over the last three years, I've been interested in performance art. 
I was very upset by the fact that he was unlawfully arrested for no reason whatsoever other than supporting arts and culture. I made a large portrait of Osman Kavala to walk in his footsteps. I walked through the areas he loved, soaked up the smells he loved, and I took him on a walk through the streets of Istanbul for a total of 15 hours in three days, five hours a day. For me, that was very, very exciting. But of course, this isn't just about Osman Kavala. His portrait is a symbol for the whole situation. Demir Tash and so many others who are innocent and still in prison for no reason, that's something that bothers me a lot. During the performance, I did of course think it could be dangerous, because the government has treated Osman Kavala very harshly. But I thought that despite everything, something must be done. Because in this country, if three people gather, they risk being arrested. There are political prisoners in this country. In spite of everything, I thought someone must speak up. Osman Kavala's lawyer heard about the performance and asked if he could have some photos. So I printed a few out and gave them to him. He took the pictures straight to Osman Kavala, who apparently laughed and said they made him very happy. From the very first day of my imprisonment, I have felt the comforting solidarity of my young artist friends. Through a lawyer friend, they send me notes and drawings that they've made on the way to Salivri. Simply knowing that they are nearby and going through these notes is incredibly heartening. Today, we're going to Salivri Prison. Of course, we can't visit Osman Kavala directly, because it's forbidden. Only his lawyers are allowed in. Each of us has written a little message or a letter, and we'll only be able to wait in the parking lot. It's like a declaration of solidarity from afar, but it's important to us that he knows we're there. Silivri, it's a high security prison. It takes about two hours or so to get there from Istanbul. It means families or relatives visiting inmates need a whole day, which puts them under enormous strain. It depends on the mood of the soldiers and the police officers. Sometimes we get as far as the parking lot, sometimes we're kilometers away. Then we're assigned a particular spot and we can open our banners. Osman Kavala's case concerns everyone, because there's no crime. Things like this only happen in authoritarian regimes and dictatorships. We oppose that, and that's why we're here.
I hope he gets his freedom back and that he sees his family again. I think his sight has deteriorated because he's not been able to see the horizon for years now. He's probably got problems moving around because of walking on hard ground. I hope he'll be reunited with his loved ones. I want him to see the sea. I want him to see the sky. I want him to be able to see into the distance. We're not so young anymore. Perhaps these things are easier to bear when you're young and you have your whole life ahead of you. But at our age, when it's not even clear how many years we have left, it's obviously a very hard thing to steal five long years from our lives. Of course it affects him. It's impossible not to be affected by it. Nearly two years ago, a young friend of mine, not in prison, passed away from a heart attack. There were times when I thought whether something like that could happen to myself. In prison, one often has thoughts about death. However, I have never worried about the prospect of spending the rest of my life behind bars. I simply cannot foresee when I'll be released. 